My mother was a seamstress raised by her mother and her aunt. That is, her mother, my grandmother, was a publican and a real estate agent. And her aunt, that is my great aunt, ran her own business as a tie manufacturer. During the Great Depression in the 30s, my father, who was a printer, was unemployed for over a year, and fortunately his uncle helped him start his own business. Once my parents married, my mother quit her job because she didn't think it right for one family to have two incomes while others didn't have any. Such voluntary communal thinking is almost unimaginable in our individualistic current society. And sometimes the communal thinking of that period was compulsory. Uh, for example, between 1930 and 1980, the Barrier Industrial Council of Broken Hill placed a ban on married women working so that the single women could get jobs in the town of Broken Hill and not leave to go for the city. But generally, this kind of communal thinking, voluntary or compulsory, this kind of understanding of work has almost entirely disappeared. So, for example, when I talk to my older brother, not Peter, he's my younger brother, who's older than me, but my older, older brother, <laughs> as he approached retirement from the public service, I asked him if he was planning to do voluntary work of some kind. His reply kind of shocked me. He said, if they're not willing to pay me for the job, then they don't value it, and if they don't value it, why should I? Do you see the kinds of changes that have come concerning work over the generations just within one family? There's no magic age of yesteryear that we want to return to. We couldn't even if we wanted to, but we shouldn't want to. Society changes and we're not able to recreate the past. Nor should we judge the past on today's conditions or ideas. They were different worlds than the one we live in. So let me start tonight's talk on women and work by giving you the principle that I've devised for this talk. The principle is that your decisions about work reflect and express your values, priorities and understanding conditioned by the circumstances of life. And let me explain that quickly what I mean by this principle, though the rest of the evening is going to be about explaining, defending, expounding this principle. Firstly then, uh, your values. You see, your values are the importance of the worth that you, that you place on things or on experiences. The importance you place on them, the worth you give to them. Your priorities are the implementation of your values, the choices you make, especially with priorities, the decisions not to do some things for the sake of other things. My wife apologises, Helen can't be with us tonight. She's made a priority decision not to be here tonight, not to meet with you, not to support me, although I'm sure she's supporting us all in prayer. <laughs> but one of our friends is going through an incredibly difficult birth at the moment in the local hospital, and she's there visiting there. The baby's been born, but it's a very difficult situation, and uh, they're having a baptism tonight. And so she's with this mother and this child. Now, there's a priority decision, that it's more that one or those two are more important than us. That's the nature of priorities. That's the nature of values that you hold, that you implement by priorities. By understanding, I mean your worldview, your worldview of life itself, of work, of, of being a woman, of being human, of being a creature. Now, to help us understand our values, priorities, let me contrast with the secularist or the materialistic understanding 
with the Christian worldview. See, most of our society has embraced the secularist or materialistic understanding of life and therefore of work in life. And many people don't realise it or think about it, but have just found themselves swimming in the secularist river, being carried along by the current of society, the fads and fashion of our times. In a secularist world, philosophical materialism, that is the view that there's nothing else in the universe other than the matter itself, always leads to economic materialism. The values and priorities of economic materialism are that of acquisition, of possessions, of experiences. It's, a, it's marked by our society by consumerism, by individualism, by hedonism, by careerism. Finding life's meaning and purpose in personal success, in significance, even fame, if that may be the case, in power, in, the, in being important, in having an impact on others or on society. Here's the typical Western culture of today, floating in the tide of materialism, uh, generally crushing the protests of the poor young countercultural idealists who eventually will turn 30. <laughs> Christians should also be protesting against this Western materialism by preaching against it and by living in holiness, that is, living differently. On the topic of work, that means that Christians should work because of our love, our love for God and our love for our neighbours, which is a totally different motivation for work than the work of our society. But sadly, all too many Christians in the West have accommodated their lifestyle to the materialism of atheism and compromised their faith with the love of this world. They've not chosen holiness. They don't want to be different. They've not chosen the love of God and the love of their neighbour above all. They don't see their employment in terms of loving family and loving neighbours. They're not working for the Lord when they go to work in the, or in the way in which they do their work. They've given up doing the work of the Lord, of preaching the gospel and of building the church. They are living just as non-Christians are living, though wearing the badge of Christianity. Uh, you can find out about uh, this kind of problems and work in the Queen's Birthday Converse Convention we held right here on uh, the Queen's Birthday weekend back in June this year with two talks. Uh, that's why the essay from Andrew Heard that came out of that. Uh, we gave that out of that talk and he's given permission for us to recycle it. Please read it at home, not tonight. I saw you, Alison. And... Uh, uh, but the two talks were there. Al Stewart spoke on the work of the Lord and I spoke on work for the Lord. But tonight we're looking at the women and work. And before seeing the Bible's view of it, I thought it wise to outline something of the sources and circumstances of the current culture's understanding of women and work. See, the source of our understanding, yours and mine, of women and work is derived from many things, but mainly from circumstances. People just drift into their work. Uh, they do so firstly as an understanding from their family background and structure, the role of work that played in our family, in our life, in, especially in mum's life. Uh, secondly, we get it from our society and culture, the socialisation we received at school. You can do anything you want to do, which of course is totally absurd because we can't all be Prime Minister, we can't all win the gold medal, we can't all, but don't worry about it, you can do anything you want to do, don't, whatever you do, think at school. Or the impact of our public media or advertising upon us. Thirdly, the opportunities of life provide for us an understanding of our work. How we relatively thoughtlessly go with the flow, making decisions in the light of the given opportunities that were just there for us at the moment at which we needed to do something. 
However, some people make their decisions more deliberately and intentionally than the majority. The Marxists and the capitalists have distinctive ideas about the philosophy of work. The feminists have made the issue of women and work one of their prime concerns. Sometimes there is a combination of Marxism and feminism that has developed a particular philosophy of work which has sadly helped the capitalists the most. The society as a whole, through journalists, universities, schools, has been heavily influenced and even shaped by these philosophical discussions of the last 50 years. Uh, the second wave feminists of the 1960s to the 1980s in particular were adamant in trying to rescue women out of the slavery of the voluntary domestic drudgery that marriage and family life imposed upon them in order that women could have a greater role in the public domain of commercial, intellectual and political society. The success of this movement is reflected in the statistics of women's entry into the workforce and the present taboos surrounding questioning the sacred cow of women in the workforce. Here's the graph from the Australian Bureau of Statistics uh, showing the makeup of the labour force from 1978 to 2012. You'll see that men have dropped from 65% of the workforce to 55%, while women have correspondingly increased from 35% to 45% of the workforce. However, labour statistics are never quite that simple, as this graph on growth in employment over the same period demonstrates. For male part-time jobs have increased dramatically the top line, whereas their full-time jobs have only kept up with population growth. It's the bottom green line. A um, little colour blind, so you can never be sure my coloured identification is correct. The female uh, full-time jobs have only just kept up with population growth, but are way ahead of where the men are. And the female part-time jobs have increased even more. Furthermore, this growth in women in the workforce is not evenly distributed across all sectors, but is mainly in the growth of employment with white collar, administration, professional, educational areas. In 1966, uh, the breakup between production, uh, here we have the proportion of all employed people employed in production of service industries. The top line is the service industries, the bottom line, the production industries. The production industries are agriculture, mining, building, manufacturing, the things that make things. The service industries, administration, professions, education. It was about 40-60 back in 1966. It's now about 80-20 in 2011. I only pick up the figures just from the ABS whenever I see them. I'm sure the direction will have been even wider by 2017. Uh, the shift from blue-collar workers to white-collar workers has also been clear. It was uh, clearly the blue-collar workers were the greater number back in 1966, but they crossed over in the mid-1970s, and so now only 30% of our employment is in blue-collar and 70% is in white-collar employment. So the feminist entry of women into the paid workforce occurred propitiously at the time when the whole of our workforce was shifting from traditional male occupations of heavy, manual, repetitive, non-thinking work in building, manufacture and mining, very suitable for men, to more cognitive, cleaner, uh, less physically demanding white collar work of professions, administration, education and air conditioning. <laughs> Today, 60% of university students are female. Let's ponder that for a moment when we talk about equal work and equal pay and all the rest of it. 60% of university students today are female. It also occurred during the time of massive increase in wealth and the reduction in household drudgery with the arrival of washing machines, dryers, dishwashers and the like. 
the one I like most, is our robo, uh, robot um, vacuum cleaner. It's terrific. Married life has improved vastly <laughs> since the robo has entered our home. We now live together, Helen, Philip and Daisy. <laughs> Now, there's been a significant, measurable change in women's lives through this period. You see, the number of children per mother has decreased to be below the replacement fertility rate of 2.1 per woman to now 1.8, lower than even in the midst of the Great Depression of the 1930s and not replacing ourselves as a community. That is an extraordinary thing that has happened. And you can see that it took place from the 70s onwards. Very stark change in our society. The age of first time mothers has increased uh, so that Australian mothers are amongst the oldest in the world. The average increase from the low 20s in the 1960s to around 30 for the first child in the 1990s. I won't enter into the immigration debate, but uh, to make Australian, uh, but uh, that also affects the present and future generations, as migrants have a much higher fertility rate. Uh, it distorts, therefore, and masks the reality of wealthy Australian born women having very few children. And the long term change in our society is inevitable as long as we keep going in this way. Uh, I'm neither for it or against it, I'm just saying that's the way it is. They, that's so-called the facts, that's what's happening. It might be a good thing to get rid of the Anglos. <laughs> uh, certainly from the point of view of keeping people converted, it would seem to be. There's also, of course, been a decrease in leaving the workforce in the season of motherhood. You get that one? So here's a graph that shows the change. The bottom line is the line of the 1960s. And you will notice that around about their mid-20s, women left the workforce because that was the time at which they were having children and they didn't return to the workforce. Whereas today, there is a little dip, but it's not much. And they continue in the workforce until their mid-40s uh, and 50s when there is a decline. However, this graph may well be different in a few years' time. The 2017 graph might be different in that that larger hump might have continued across further. That's an age difference thing, a generational difference thing that's happening. If you want to see the significance of the difference between men and women, notice the men's graph at this point. As with most things, dead simple. <laughs> but so much for the statistics of the changing world. What about the women that this, these statistics, these numbers are reflecting? What's happened to the women in the changing world? Well, confusion about marriage and motherhood reigns everywhere. The excitement and pleasure in career development is being testified to. The guilt, uncertainty and defensiveness about childcare is also universal. The tiredness and exhaustion of trying to get the work-life balance right is also part of the new life. And the two-income wealth now makes housing unreachable, even for the two-income families. See, over the last few months, as I've been thinking about this talk tonight, I've been reading newspapers and, and looking for articles for tonight. I've given up in the last week or two because not a day goes past without one or more of these subjects being main articles about life and society and today. These are the effects that are different, though, for different uh, different. Uh, women. 
They're different for different seasons of life. They're different for the single, as opposed to the married without children, as opposed to the married mothers, as opposed to the single mothers, as opposed to the empty nesters, as opposed to the grandmothers. It's also different for different kinds of work. And you only have to think about what work means for a professional worker compared to someone involved in house or hospital domestic work. There's not a single image of women and there's no person that can speak for all women because all women cannot be grouped. That's part of the problem of the very topic. It's part of the problem of the struggle that each of us has to face. But the feminists have changed their mind in this changing world. I want to quickly run through with you what's happened to the feminists. I'm just going down here, these same ones again. Here's Gloria Steinem back in 1973. We have to abolish and reform the institution of marriage. By the year 2000, we will, I hope, have raised our children to believe in human potential, not God. The 1970s second wave feminists were fiercely atheistic, though many a Christian got into, bed, got into bed with them. Jermaine Greer wrote, if women are to affect a significant amelioration in their condition, it seems obvious that they must refuse to marry. She went on in 1971 to say, the housewife is an unpaid employee in her husband's house in return for the security of being a permanent employee. It gets worse. Andrea Dawkin in 1983 says, like prostitution, marriage is an institution that is extremely oppressive and dangerous for women. I'm talking the second wave feminism. The third wave feminism thinks that prostitution is actually a good thing for women, that it's a piece of uh, assertiveness. But back in the second generation, they still had some morality. But Catherine McKinnon thought all sex, even consensual sex between married couple is an act of violence perpetrated against a woman. They were anti-marriage. Our Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, was one of them. The reason she didn't approve of homosexual marriage was because she didn't believe in marriage, which has been reflected in her choices of life. But by the 1990s, the results were starting to be noticed. In one survey of 100,000 women, 100,000 across the USA and Britain, there was found that the level of happiness and satisfaction had declined sharply from 1970 to the late 1990s. Such patterns of research are consistently showing up. We are much more unhappy today than our mothers or our grandmothers were. But it's not just these statistics. By the late 80s and the 90s, even some of the feminism's founders were recognising that it wasn't working for women. So Germaine Greer, women's lives, she's writing 1999 now, women's lives have become more, not less, difficult. It's in her book, The Whole Woman, 2000. Uh, the evidence is that it's getting worse. 30 years ago, we heard nothing about panic attacks, anorexia, self-mutilation. Now the icons of female suffering are all around us. Uh, similarly, Betty Frieden wrote in The Second Stage, I think we must at least admit and begin openly to discuss the feminist denial of the importance of family, of women's own needs to care and get love and to nurture tending, loving care. To deny the part of women of one's being a woman that has through the ages been expressed in motherhood, nurturing, loving, softness and tiger strength, is to deny part of one's personhood as woman. The next one is one of the saddest of comments you will see. Germaine Greer, she said, I was desperate for a baby and have the medical bills to prove it. So in the 70s, Babies, motherhood, marriage, family. <clears throat> By the 1990s, I wish. But of course, it was too late. Betty Feeden, the equality we fought for isn't livable, isn't workable, isn't comfortable in the terms that structured our battle. Those women who believe it is, who live alone repudiating marriage and motherhood, are living a life defined by reaction against the family, 
whistling a brave tune to hide the loneliness and yearning for some form of family. The conflict between and the failure of second wave feminism and women is well portrayed in three books that I draw to your attention and commend to you. All three are by authors who started out as feminists. Only one of the books is a Christian book. Two of them have renounced feminism. I'm not sure of the third. Professor James Tooley is a professor of education in England who spent his life constructing feminist curricula for British educational system and came to the conclusion towards the end that actually it was all a mistake. It's not what women wanted, it's what social engineers wanted for women. And he wrote this book, The Miseducation of Women. I'm not sure you can read the title, it's uh, just the picture that is there, The Miseducation of Women. It is a startling book to read and a great repentance of a man who was a committed leading male feminist. Another one is Sylvia uh, Ann Hewlett. Uh, I, I read the professor's book on the uh, Kindle, so I can't show it to you, but here's Creating Life, Professional Women and the Quest for Children, a very, very sad book. This is many, many boxes of tissues when you read this one. As this feminist goes around the great leading, uh, uh, the great leading women of the 20th century, at the end of the 20th century, the, the millennial kind of women, the ones who were CEOs of companies and the rest, to find out what their life was about. And every one of them, what their life was about was the misery of missing out on family life. It's an extraordinary book. It turned out to be exactly the opposite of what the woman who wrote it thought it would be. And then there is a third book by our own Kirsty Burkett, who wrote, Feminism is a selfish movement with no sustainable philosophy, a fabricated history, an incoherent morality. It does not bring freedom and fulfilment for women, and it will not write injustices. She wrote that at the end of the uh, century. It's a fascinating Christian book. It's only got one Bible verse in it. Uh, she wrote it as a feminist. She'd just become a Christian, and she'd always been a feminist. And she wrote it as a feminist, to, uh, as a kind of introduction to feminism before she then talked about how the Bible related to feminism. But by the time she'd finished investigating feminism properly, she worked out there was no point connecting the Bible to it because it was, as she says, a selfish movement with no sustainable philosophy and fabricated history. She has a PhD in the history and philosophy of science, so when she says it's got no sustainable philosophy and no real history, she knows what she's talking about. <laughs> it's a very interesting read, feminism. You can't get it from the library because this is the library copy. Um, <laughs> so I commend to you those three books that just take you through second wave feminism. But let's turn then to a biblical understanding of women and work. We gather a biblical understanding of any topic by noting the developing storyline of the Bible from creation through the fall, from God's preparation for Christ's redemption in the history of Israel, from redemption in Christ through to the new redemption, the, sorry, the new creation. It's commenced in Christ and only fulfilled in his return. It's in each of these phases or waves that God's word speaks to us, though each phase is taken up and altered and fulfilled by the subsequent phase. The topic of work commences in the very first chapter of creation, for in Genesis 1, we find that God works. Not only works, but in chapter 2, verse 4, we find he also rests, for there's more to God than work, and there's more to his world than work. Furthermore, he creates man in his image, male and female, he creates them to work for him. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Notice from this passage, a very well-known passage, that Jesus saw as the foundation text for heterosexual marriage, 
when he refers to it in Matthew 19, notice in this passage that uh, both male and female are in the one image of God. That the command to be fruitful and to multiply, and the command to subdue the earth, for it was not perfect, and the demand, dominion of man is over all of, all of the creatures. The second passage that Jesus refers to on the subject of the creation of marriage also involves work. It's Genesis chapter 2, where man is put in the garden to work it and to keep it, verse 15 of Genesis 2. Then in Genesis 3, we see the fall where man, sin and God's judgment are accounted. Man does not sin in his work, but in his marriage by listening to his wife, verse 17. And God's judgment is upon man in his work. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth uh, for you. And you shall eat of the plants of the fields. By the sweat in your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. In the rest of the Bible, we see sin and judgment enter into work. Now, there are references to the way in which work uh, is affected by sinfulness and folly, the crooked scales, uh, the failure to keep the Sabbath, the laziness of the sluggard, the thief, and the liar, the ever-present reality of death, making mockery and meaninglessness in all our work. Yet one passage is more important than them, than all of them really, and that's the time when man used his work in order to sin. You find it in Genesis 11 and the Tower of Babel, where united humanity tried to storm heaven. Notice their motivation in Genesis 11 verse 4, to make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the earth. Notice they used their work, their technology, making bricks because there were no stones there. Notice also God's assessment of them. In Genesis uh, 11, uh, pick it up the second sentence there. This is only the beginning of what they will do and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible to them. The meaning and significance of humanity, its redemption and salvation is not to be found in our work. To view work that way is to join the sin of Babel and is bound to lead to the frustration of Babel, for Babel is under the judgment of God. So how are we to understand work in the world today? In the light of Christ's redemptive purposes? Well, Paul outlines the work in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 for its basic function of living lovingly with others. Uh, the chapter and the whole perception of work is fairly prosaic. We work to feed ourselves, to house ourselves, to shelter ourselves. We work so as not to be idle, but not to be busybodies. We work to take responsibility for ourselves and not to burden others. As I said, it's fairly prosaic. It's fairly matter-of-factish is the reason for work. You can go across to other passages of similar character, but it, they all come to much the same. For example, Ephesians 4, the thief is no longer to work, no longer to steal, but to now work with honest hands in order to be able to give to those who are in need. Or 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, they're told that they are to work in order to walk properly before outsiders and not to be dependent upon others. It's a very basic thing, the doctrine of work in the scriptures. This biblical understanding of work, where does it locate women in it all? Well, back in creation, women are included both in chapters 1 and 2. For we are created male and female that we may marry and fulfil the command to be fruitful, multiply and fill the earth. God created one humanity in his image that expands by procreation into the humans that cover the face of the earth. 
all are in that one image of God. All share in that one status of humanity and all share in that one task of subduing the world and having dominion over the animals. But sexual polarity, the binary reproductive gender, if you like, is built into our very creation. Male and female, he created them. And in Genesis 2, no animal was seen to be suitable helper for the man. Each was created for him, but none of them were suitable. And then the woman was created from him and for him. And in his delight, he declared, at last, a suitable colleague. I have a shovel for her with which to dig, an axe for her with which to chop, a hoe with which she can furrow, and a scythe with which she can harvest. Now at last I have a labourer who can work in the garden with me. <laughs> That's not exactly what he said. <laughs> for that wasn't his understanding of helper. Her work had little to do with her suitability to help like that. Rather, his statement pointed to their unity. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And God's purpose is declared to be marriage. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Here we see the creation of the woman as the only helper suitable for him, for she is the only one fully like him, created in the image of God. This view of the woman created for marriage to the man is reflected in the fall, both in the sin of Adam and in the judgment of God. The woman's judgment is pain in her childbearing. This is more than labour pains. It's the whole pain of reproduction and its failures. It's the reason why we have gynaecology departments and hospitals, but we don't have andrecology departments and andrecology hospitals. We don't need to set aside whole hospitals for men, but for women, and added to it is the conflict with her husband instead of unity. But notice also the way that sin comes, for it comes from the animal to the woman to the man. And notice the way accountability comes, for God questions the man first, and then the woman, and then the animal. And notice the way the judgment comes, it comes to the animal first. For now, he is to be crushed by the woman and then to the woman. For now, pain as wife and mother. And then to the man, now pain in his labour and toil of gardening. The very patterned nature of Genesis 1 to 11 is too great to ignore the patterning that you see in Genesis chapters 2 and 3. Family life and relationships hold a different place in the creation of woman than that of man, as work holds a different place in the creation of man than that of woman. Not that man is disinterested or should be in any way distance or di from marriage and family life, or that women never do any gardening or even must marry. But there is a gender orientation that differs in our creation and that is not cancelled in our sin and judgment. Rather, it is continued and made more difficult and painful by our sin and under the judgment of God. Furthermore, it's not by man, not by man's work, that we will find redemption. But rather, through the woman comes the redemption. Through her child, the son, the serpent's head will be crushed. Into this context of Genesis 1 to 3, we read Proverbs 31. The extraordinary hard-working woman who is, I hope you'll notice, a wife. 
whose work benefits, benefits her husband, her children, her household, and through them, the whole city. She works, she really does work, she works in the public arena of commerce, buying flax and wool and food from afar. She buys a field and she plants a vineyard. She sells the garments she makes and she's generous to the poor. Yet her work is for her family, doing good to her husband, providing food for her family and clothing her family richly. And her work is not simply commercial and material, she opens her mouth with wisdom. Teaching of kindness is on her tongue in verse 26 of that chapter. And she's not idle. She's no busybody. No. As with the young remarried widows of 1 Timothy 5, she manages her own household. And as with the young wives of Titus 2, she's busy working at home. But all she does finds praise from her children, and her husband, for she's a woman who fears the Lord. She's like the Christian woman of 1 Timothy 2, known for her good works. Her work is a blessing to all the city, for because of her work, her husband can make the contribution he does in the gate amongst the elders. <coughs> However, in the gospel by the resurrection of Jesus, we know that the form of this world is passing away. The time is coming when we will not die anymore, and so we will not marry or be given in marriage anymore. Thus, in 1 Corinthians 7, we read of people choosing to be single in order to devote themselves fully to the Lord, especially in the light of the difficulties of life. So we may live differently to the world not so as to join them in the money-making hedonism, but so as to give ourselves more single-mindedly to the Lord. That is, by and large, our Western civilization has turned its back on marriage. Christians will not do that because marriage is such a high ideal for us. However, because of creation. However, in the light of the return of the Lord Jesus, we have another high ideal, which would set aside marriage for the sake of working fully for the Lord. And so we may choose not to marry, but not as the world chooses not to marry in order to live a more fulfilling, hedonistic, self-satisfied life, but rather to devote ourselves more single-mindedly to the Lord. So let's now return back to the principle that I outlined. Your decision about work reflects, expresses your values, priorities and understanding conditioned by the circumstances of life. How would we understand and summarise these values that should govern our priorities? We who are Christians. Note firstly, you choose how you spend your time and labour. These are your decisions, your decisions about work. I've forgotten which of our three sisters earlier pointed this out. I think it was Margaret who said, you only answer to one. That was Margaret, I was right. right. Uh, it's your decision between you and God what you are going to do. Secondly, your decisions will inevitably reflect and express you. For your values are demonstrated by your priorities. As you choose to spend your time, your money, especially your time, your life, in some activities and in making of that choice, especially choose not to spend them in other activities, so what you value What's important to you will be revealed. Sometimes it reveals how thoughtless you are. Sometimes it reveals how thoughtful you are. But it will reveal who and what you are. Thirdly, hopefully, as a thoughtful person, 
the values that your priority, your choices reflect, will be based on an understanding of the Bible, that you'll live in the fear of the Lord, like the hard-working woman of Proverbs 31. And in the fear of the Lord, we'll make those decisions that will bring blessing to you and through you to your husband and to your children and through them to the city. So fourthly, with Christian understanding of values, and for, uh, of values, we should expect to see something different in the generality of how Christians live. There will be great diversity amongst us. Some will do it one way, some will do it the other way. But as a whole, we should be different to the way the world does it. In what ways? Well, we'll be for, pro, loving God and loving our neighbours above all our own interests. And therefore, we'll be opposed, we'll be anti the acquisition of things or the acquisition of experiences, the, the bucket list of what I must do before I die, the importance of seeing Niagara fall. Been falling for a long time. But <laughs> it's the importance of going and seeing the Taj Mahal so that I can take a photograph, which won't be as good as the ones on Google anyway. <laughs> we'll be opposed to the climbing in power and status and significance, for these are not the things of a Christian mind. And so we'll be anti the kind of career trajectories of seeing how we're going to move up and up, on and further. And we'll be opposed to the love and service of money, for money will not be the chief factor in our considerations, for we do not live for the love of money. That is not our way. You cannot serve God and money. And so we will be very different to the way the world treats money. Uh, that means, amongst other things, that for us, work is not limited to financial remuneration. Work will include all our voluntary expenditure of labour, time and energy, whether we're paid for it or whether we're not paid for it. It is all the same to us. Nobody works harder, in my view of life, than a young mother. I don't think anyone works quite as hard as the woman who's got two or three little children, other than the one who's got twins or triplets. <laughs> that is really, really hard work. May not be paid, but I defy you to say she's not a hard-working woman. That's ridiculous. It's really hard work. Maybe she should be paid, maybe, but the point is, it's work, and it must be seen as work. It's hard work. And nothing is more important that we do in a week than teaching our Sunday school class. Suffer the little children to come unto me, said the Lord Jesus. Whatever else I do, teaching my Sunday school class, the children, the things of God. You can't get to any activity much more important than that activity. Whatever else you do during the course of the week, and yet it's voluntary. It's not paid, but it's real work. And nothing is much more important than that work. As I think Elizabeth said for us, look to the work that has eternal significance. Well, that's the work that has eternal significance. And we will be people who will be pro-marriage and children as part of our humanity. That is, we will not want to just go along with the drift of our society to have a smaller and smaller families, but the Christian car park is generally filled with kinds of family-moving vehicles. <laughs> A few dollars for every tarago sold to Christians over the last part of the 20th century would make you very rich. And it should be thus, for we are for family life. But we're also work out of our individual responsibility for the social good. 
That is, loving your neighbour, not having your self-fulfilment. This was the kind of voluntary Christian morality that our society knew back in the days of the Depression when my mother would not work because there were two incomes in this family and there were all these other families that had no income. That's very Christian thinking. Though in the Australia of the 1930s, it was normal thinking. Not deeply reflective of the Bible, I'm sorry to say, but coming out of the Bible as understanding our place in the community and our love for our neighbour. It means that we will be for giving ourselves to others for their good, especially for their salvation. And again, it means that we'll be for rest, as there's more to life than work, and we'll be opposed to those greedy capitalists who keep on forcing our governments in their cowardly weakness and mindlessness to do away with penalty rates on weekends and force the poor people of our society to work at times when their families would love to see them, to work at the most unenviable times of the week, late at night and early in the mornings and on weekends. It is the gutlessness of our politicians, the corruption of our commercial system. We'll be concerned for the poor and the weak and the frail, and we'll be concerned for their opportunities for work. But we'll also be opposed to that idea that man's salvation, man's fulfilment, man's significance is found in our employment. For that is not where we are or who we are or how we will solve the problem of the fall. It is by the birth of the woman's son that the curse of the fall is reversed. And so, fifthly on my list, if I forgot to tell you the numbers earlier, I'm sorry. <laughs> As Christian wives and mothers, our values will be to see our family priority over ourselves and our work. Our work, we will see, is a part of our contribution to our family. Now, here at this point, everybody says, yes, well, of course, that's what I'm doing. But remember, you can't fool two people, God and your teenager. <laughs> they will see whether your motives are are to work for the good of the family or to work to satisfy yourself. That's really the issue. It's in the heart, but it will be seen. What is in the interest of your family? That's the question for wives to be asking, mothers to be asking. What is the interest of your family? I'll give you two options. More money or more mummy? <laughs> Which is it? Nearly all children will tell you, more mummy. For time is more valuable than money. And yet, sixthly, all of this is conditioned by circumstances. Here we have to take into account the time and place that we're living in. We live in Australia, in Sydney, in the 21st century. We also have to take into account our season of life, which is so much more significant for women, whether single or married, with or without small children, than it is for men. So many circumstances are involved. Your good health, your education, your, your ability to have children or the ability of your husband to give you children your abilities to do the jobs that are open and available to be done and the work that is required that would be remunerate, remunerate you. But with the circumstances, we need to remember two things. One, we can change them sometimes. We're not locked always into our circumstances. We can seek freedom from our slavery. And where there is freedom from our slavery, Paul says, take it. But if there's no freedom, 
then be content. But there are times, there are opportunities to change your circumstances. And secondly, God is sovereign over all our circumstances. He gives them to us for our good. And so we do need to learn to be content. My sisters, if God had wanted you to be brothers, then he would have made you such. Brothers, if he'd wanted you to be a sister, he would have made you as such. My sisters, if he wanted you taller, he would have made you taller. If he wanted you shorter, he'd make you shorter. If he wanted you to be a blonde, you would be. And if he wanted you to be joining the vast majority of humanity with black hair, he would have made you that way. <laughs> You do not need to change the circumstances of life as if somehow God has made a mistake on your part. You are what you are because God is sovereign over you and has made you the way you are and your circumstances, yes, you can change them sometimes, but you can learn contentment with them, in them as well. But Philip, you're saying, should I work? Or shouldn't I work outside the home for income? Well, the answer is not that simple. It's more about why should you work and why shouldn't you? It's more about what are the consequences of your choices? What, what do your choices say about you and about your real values, your real desires, your real heart? I would say to any wife and mother, your work outside the home should be for the home, for the home takes priority over work. But that means sometimes you will work, for that is the way the home is best served. Sometimes it'll be part-time work, sometimes it'll be full-time work. Sometimes it'll involve retraining to be able to work less time for more money. Sometimes. There's any number of choices, you see. But it's the motivations, the aim, the, the intention. I do expect that Christian women will work in quite different ways to non-Christian women. Just as I expect that Christian men will work in quite different ways to Christian men. And that priority of people over things, family over self, will mean a lot of Christian women will choose to work in people industries and at home rather than the world of highly successful commerce, giving themselves to their family and their neighbourhood and especially to the salvation of others.